Good morning and welcome to our Live Talk program. This is Lloyd Grubb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our Live Talk program covering natural health on your Wednesday morning rise and shine. Natural health that we're doing here this morning and we're looking at the topic, Life is Not the survival of the fittest, but it is a struggle. So life is not the survival of the fittest, but it's a struggle. So we're looking at this this morning here as we do our natural health, um, and we're focused here on natural mental health. So welcome again. Hopefully you had a blessed night rest, and, you had, and you're ready to take on it today. Thanks for joining me here. Let's pray. Our Father, Lord in heaven, we thank you again for your word and the way that you continue to guide us along in this life and continue to teach us your way. I pray, Lord, that you may be with us and bless us, and may we truly, dear Lord, submit to your teachings and your will. This is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. So um, what I'm sharing here is a life ideology that is important as we pull from the Bible. And what it is is um, life is not the survival of the fittest, um, but it is a struggle. And when you read the Bible, you come upon, and I'll go into the text in a little bit, you will come upon um, the Bible talking about because of sin and the devil, that life is a struggle, that we rest not against flesh and blood. We have an enemy that is a lion, roaring lion, seeking who we may destroy. Um, But as you go through life, like Adam and Eve, you can feel like at times you're in a garden of Eden and everything is fine. And then there's the sudden destruction. The Bible teaches us that as we come towards the end of life uh, or the end of this world, and even as life had continued for many, many millennia, uh, that you you will see this idea here that all of a sudden destruction comes suddenly. But while it's coming, uh, the preachers, the false prophets always are preaching peace, peace, and safety when Peace and safety is far, far away, and it's soon to be destruction. So we don't want to be those that live in that type of um, mindset. Uh, the Bible also teaches us that the mind is desperately wicked. A mind that is not controlled by the Spirit of God is simply desperately wicked. But somebody say, well, my neighbor is a nice person. And I'm like, yeah, you're waiting for the disaster to come. They're nice on the surface because people know quite well how to um, hide what they are and the monsters that are inside them. As a matter of fact, many people will tell you that there's a demon inside of them and they're struggling with it. And often you hear people will say before they die or before they write a note or before they do some dangerous crime that the devils or the demons overcome them. So because of this, one has to live life with a certain ideology, understanding that you're walking in the valley of the shadow of death And you will fear no evil, but God does call you. That is important for you. When he calls you to his walk, it's important you to acknowledge that you are a sheep amongst wolves. And one has to be very smart, very um, make your movement like a serpent, although you are a sheep. Because if you don't, then you get eaten. And you you don't want to get eaten by the lions and the bears and the wild animals out there. And so I want to talk about that this morning because... um, I noticed that there's so many people being clubbed, and especially those who are normally the head of the madness in the society. Um, I was reading an article recently about how YouTubers, and I probably will reference this article as I go through, but how uh, the YouTube tubers that are the biggest names on YouTube, how they burn out because they're um, chasing after that um, reality, that YouTube fame, and like all of the superstars, they get burnt out the schedule, the requirement to stay on top, the constant intrusion into their own lives by themselves to become famous. And as they look at that, you are, are people who understand that this is part of the struggle in life. You have to survive. It's a survival. So again, my topic is life is not the survival of the fittest, but it is a struggle. Um, and if you look at life, it sometimes can seem like it's a survival of the fittest. So you must learn to survive longer. That's all it is. It is just how to survive longer. And when we look at natural health, that's the main point to me that I take away from natural health. Uh, the main concept of natural health is self-control. And why you're doing that is because you're learning to resist the bad and partake of the good. Self-control just gives you the ability to be able to look at something that's bad and walk away from it or reject it. 
or if it is even good but it's not good in high volumes to heat it in low volumes or in reasonable volumes oh, that's all self-control is doing why because it makes you survive it makes you live longer so you can stay in the struggle longer and so if you go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 18 and 19, Genesis chapter 3, verse 18 and 19 is that massive scripture that um, can be so easily missed by those who read the Bible. You can breeze over it, but it's a very important scripture to understand life. And when you understand life, as I say, life is not the survival of the fittest. Here I'm referencing the principle that Darwin put forward as you look at nature and you look at life, he sees struggle. And he sees struggle and you look at that struggle and he titled it survival of the fittest. And so many people have looked at that theory and say, it's true. I can see it everywhere. I look at life. I see struggle. I see every day I get up to work. It's not just I'm working to make money. I have to struggle to keep my job, to keep uh, my status, to keep my place in, at the work. I have to struggle against people who are trying to get me fired and stuff like that. Life is constantly a struggle you look at the wars that are fought for various different reasons and you look at nature nature is like animals um, are trying to survive they always jittery every animal when I say animal I mean just creatures whether it's the birds or the spiders you know everything is always like jittery um, always looking out for themselves you know because they think something's gonna eat them or kill them and that's life and so you could see now how Someone like uh, Darwin would come up with this concept and really say, yeah, that's what life is all about. Well, there's a reason for that concept there because of sin. Sin creates this paradigm or this reality. And we have to live in our life, be aware of what sin does. Because if we don't, then we get eaten and we think, well, we probably didn't survive. But yeah, it is survive, but it is just that we don't understand what we're up against. And so we think it's going to be all fun and games. And we notice that the young key people or committing suicides and stuff like that, they're doing it because they're not happy. And they're doing it because life is not coming the way that they thought it would come. But it's because they're approaching life wrong. They're approaching life and they read this thing about the survival of fittest or about this, you know, what life is all about. And it kind of doesn't tell them much what else to do i'm here going to tell you this morning what to do and what's the real way to interpret life because life because of sin it's a struggle and it's a survival but you don't survive basically because you're fittest you survive because you figure out how to survive you know and i don't want to give away too much here but it's a different concept of how to survive you know you don't you're not a lion you don't going to eat people to survive but you have to figure out how as the bible say when Christ say flee, you flee. Uh, somebody who is a survival of the fittest thinking, no, they need to stand and fight. Uh, when you're in Christ's method, Christ's method is that you need to be smart and then there are times you need to run. <laughs> but Genesis 3, 18 and 19, um, Genesis 3, 18 and 19 says, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. So he says, because of sin now, where you go to pick that fruit that you used to pick. You remember Adam basically here, God is talking to. See, you remember you used to go and pick those oranges. Beautiful, right? And in the orange skin or the rind of the orange, when you're peeling it back, Adam, you're going to get um, the, 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 <laughs> the citric bioflavonoids <laughs> on your, your hand. You remember that, Adam? And you get nutrients right there. You probably later on in life, Adam, you're going to be allergic to that thing. So there's going to be some problems. But that same orange you used to pick, all of a sudden you're going to go to the orange tree and you're going to see some thorns or pricks on the tree. And you have to be careful when you pick it. That's what happened because of sin. So life comes and you have some resistant, but you still can get some fruits. So it's how to get the fruit without getting pricked and then get an allergic reaction from the prick. Very important. So this is what the Lord is saying to Adam. So we understand from this text and from what Genesis 2 tells us that when the earth was created, there was no, there was mosquitoes probably, but not the ones that caused us to get allergic reaction and malaria. There were trees that like rose flowers and orange trees, but there was no thorns. Thorns came about after as a result of sin. And it's the curse that is upon the ground. We see that in verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread 
till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou take him, for dust thou art, and dust thou shall return. So the Lord is saying, here's your task, don't rebel against it, okay? You're going to have to work to get some food, but you're going to have some thorns, thorns you're going to deal with, deal with it. So when you approach life like this, and you say, hmm, uh, there's going to be some resistance, uh, you, are, you get up the right way out of your bed in the morning, because you know what today is, is back to the struggle. And you don't approach life as if, oh, everything is going to be fine. You approach it like stuff going to go bad and it's going to go bad sometime unaware and real rapid. And you got to be prepared for that. If you go through life and thinking, oh, my neighbor is a nice person, you are in for a surprise. But if you go through life, understand that the, the mind without God, all are fallen sin and come short of the glory. And the mind without God is desperately wicked then you'll be careful. It doesn't mean that you you don't you can't get out of your house. It just means you get out of your house and you're more careful. It doesn't mean that you have to get out of your house strapped uh, with a gun, um, but you get out more careful. And that's what it is because I think that's what's missing with the youngins. They might play the video game and they might play a game like Grand Theft Auto. And in that game, it's like it's just it's like a war zone. But in life, it doesn't come like that. Things come very peaceably, and then it becomes like one of those crazy video games. So you're never prepared. Most notice almost all the mass shootings when they happen, the SWAT team gets there when everything is already done. Like it has just happened over and over again. Every now and then they get fortunate and they get to tackle the person. But most of the time, everything is just beautiful. It's a beautiful day. And nothing can go wrong. And then all of a sudden it goes from zero to a hundred. Then when they get there, it's already done. They miss it. So when you go through life, that's the difference here. It will seem one way, but it comes across hard. So you have a philosophy. It doesn't mean that you walk around and you're panicking, but it means you have this ideology in your mind that life is like one of these crazy movies, but most of the time it's like very peaceful and nice, and then things get surprising. So you have, it's an ideology. And you just know that you're not as trusting you know, I always see people, they do investments and get burned. Yesterday I was reading about one that I made headline news because how many people got burned from this guy that is a whale whisperer. He says he can talk to animals uh, and he knows to, via music. And he built people over three point something million dollars. And I'm always like, and you know, they were telling, saying the type of people it was built in, it was people who were professionals who, you know, had money. You have to have that type of money to be able to get ripped off like that. But pe people are so uh, trusting. You know, like, oh yeah, it's going to be good. They believe anything. And they don't understand that there's people, they're just scammers. And But yet when you go through life, it make you double check. Give me more information. Um, I want to see more. Uh, but when you go through life thinking, um, you hear the principles and you, you see the Bible says, thorns and thistles, the, 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 the mind of people are desperately wicked. You see Darwin trying to understand it from a secular point of view, and he says it looked like it's a, str it's a struggle for survival. And you go through life, la da 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 and then get eaten by a monster. You got to be careful. And that's why I think why so many young people are so sad or whatever, because they think life is going to come at them easy, and it's going to be beautiful, and people are going to like them. And I'm like, you messed up and the people around you messed up. You think they're going to like you. You got to know that you are into a for a fight. And you got to know how to find people who are supportive and how to get rid of people who are not supportive. Anyhow, keep going there. Um, so we can misinterpret the thorns and thistle to mean survival of the fittest. But because of sin and the devil, we have to struggle and become tough. So because of the sin and the devil, we have to struggle and we have to become t tough. Now, some of you say, well, what's the difference, Lloyd, then? Because I've heard you now for a few minutes. What's the difference between um, dealing with thorns and thistle in life and Darwin principle of the survival of the fittest? The difference is this, right? When you're in life, you have to learn how to have allies. You know, you have to learn how to be dependent 
upon others, understanding that. You see, with survival of the existence, every man for themselves, you have to survive. You know, it's a struggle for mastery. So you're trying to conquer and dominate. Uh, but in God's system is different. And I'm going to go through some texts and some ideas. Is that in God's system, God's system is a system of love. So it's not so much, it's not so, it's just a method of how you survive. You see, it's in, in God's system, you got to know to work the system or work it different. It's a different methodology to work, you know. So you got to know to work it. And that's what I want to talk about. What's the difference? Because, as I say, life is not the survival of the fittest, but it's a struggle. So we're going to talk about that because that's more naturally the question in my mind. What's the difference? Because this text said thorns and thistle. Darwin says it's a struggle for survival. And only the fittest uh, survive. And I'm going to give you a quick example to show you what I mean. When the question is asked, who is the fittest? Somebody could say, well, the prison warden is the fittest. Because the guy that might be physically the fittest, right? You go to a, say you're, going, you're in high school, and you look around, and you say, who is the fittest in high school? And they say, the football players. But most people know a lot of the football players, they can only read. And, you know, they just, all they do is just exercise, exercise. So the fittest, normally in Darwin world, is, would be the lion. In the, say if you're in high school, the fittest would be the toughest guy. But you know that the tough guys they end up working menial jobs when they go out in life. They end up getting damaged physically because of the, the things they're doing. They end up, a lot of them bullies end up in armies and then they get dead or they come up mentally ill. So then you can, somebody could say, well, no, the fittest person is a valedictorian. Could be, that person is a valedictorian, could be the fittest because he could end up coming out and he become a lawyer and then he send everybody to prison and then he sue people and take their money. So he's the fittest. Then you find that amongst lawyers, they have some of the highest suicide rates. So then you say, well, probably he's not the fittest. So you see, and you can keep going and analyzing who is the fittest. And as you look in the adult world and the work environment, you say the CEO is the fittest because he's ripping off everybody. He's telling the soup is bored to pay millions of dollars while his lower workers are not making the money. So he's the fittest. Uh, so notice the idea of fittest is not, it's, it's very carnal in its view. It's very worldly in its view. It's basically the person who dies with the most toys are the fittest. So people who are the Warren Buffetts and Microsoft, Bill Gates and all those people, they're the fittest because they sit on top of the food chain. That's his principle. But then you start looking at life, you start realizing that there's this thing called love, happiness, satisfaction in life, physical wellness, spiritual wellness, mental wellness, you know, the happiness and then you find that a lot of time the people who are at the highest of the food chain, they might be carnally the fittest, but a lot of times they're um, socially and spiritually at the lower end. So it brings to mind in what's going on. Because remember I tell you I was reading this article and they were talking about recently, even this week, how many of the Facebook, top Facebook, um, you know, uh, producers uh, basically have quit, take a break because they're burnout out mentally. And you say, well, they're at the top of the food chain in that world, so they must be the fittest, but they're complaining now, they're very unhappy, and they just have to take a break, they have to go get some mental health, and they have to figure out how to survive. So then you say, well, they're not the fittest because mentally they're destroying themselves to become number one. So... That's why I say life is not the survival fitness because you have to understand how, what is it you're trying to accomplish and how to survive. But it is still a struggle. You still have to put some energy in there. But where are you putting the energy? You know, how is your personal life? How is your health? How is your mental, spiritual health? How is your um, family life, your social life? Because that's how you survive. You survive with, you know, the Bible says, when you have a friend that stick it closer than a brother, that's how you survive. When you know God, that's how you survive. It's, it's not just those who make the most money because as you see in life, 
and I'm gonna go to some more texts. As you see, live you see so many people who they had the, they, 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 so many of the superstars, they die so young, and they die all the time from suicide, drug overdose. Their lives are miserable, and somebody thought they won. So that's where, um, we're going. So let's let's do more here. So Matthew eleven verse twelve. And it says, Matthew 11, verse 12, it says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffer of violent, violent, violence, and the violent take it by force. So the, here goes this idea again. So it is a struggle. It is a survival. It is a fittest idea. But how do you do that fittest? What is it you're trying to accomplish? Where are you trying to get to? Because I think everybody's getting there, but how you get there, what you're trying to get Everybody's trying to get somewhere is the issue. Everybody's trying to live the life. But what is the life? And as you look at it, he says that the violent take it by force. You have to make some effort. So if you go in life and think your life is not going to come with some resistance, you fail already. Life is not going to come with some pushback. You already fail. Because it will. But where are you trying to push? How are you trying to push? And how do you survive? There's many people that are trying to push and gain the whole world, but they're lonely. And so we saw yesterday one of these famous people, uh, I can't remember if her name was Katy or something, but she's famous for making handbags. Um, she committed suicide, it seems. And um, you say, well, she's 55 or 56. She committed suicide. What happened here? She didn't. I guess she survived to a certain point. She lived the life. But how often a person is living a life and they're so miserable. Uh, they have no life. They have no quality of life. But yet they have all the material possession. And that's why you have to say, what are you trying to take? Are you trying to take a city or are you trying to control yourself? Because that's why I said the help message is about self-control, it's self-mastery. Me mastering a, a country is not the same as me mastering myself. Many people like Alexander the Great did that. He mastered the, uh, the art of war. But when it comes to mastering himself, he lost control of himself. He has no mastery over himself. You say, well, that's where the failure came in. In Ecclesiastes 9 verse 11, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 11, he says, I returned here and saw on the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. So here's a text where he talks about being diligent. Just keep going at it. So a person could be swift, but the person who knows how to survive the person is swift because they're diligently at the process and while the person is swift burn themselves out which is what many of these people are doing and they're young people the person who's going to stick in there longer is going to do better and this is where that discipline comes in nor the battle is strong there's many people who i know they were stronger than you 10 years ago physically i'm talking about but today they're not stronger than you because they wasted their substance or their energy or their power, their physical power on drugs, on alcohol, on various different lifestyle practices and you maintain your health. And so you're here in the battle and you're doing physically better while they might be ahead of you when they started because they might be born with better genetics and they were physically stronger but you survived because you figured out how to reserve your energy reserve what you already have and preserve it and even enhance what you have so because you were able to do that and I've learned that that's been my struggle is how to preserve and to enhance and to build up what I have and so as I do that I can see individuals who were born with a better set of um, chromosome, better set of DNA. That physically they were stronger, but 
as the years roll by, what they have is lessened because they're beating themselves and they're not in the struggle long term. So that's why it's important for you to know. Yes, it's, it might seem like, you know, as they say, the survival of the fittest, but the person could be fit, but how long they can be fit on alcohol. So then what, who survives then? Who makes it longer? Is it the person that really is the fittest and the strongest or the person who figure out to outmaneuver, outmaneuver the other? Because think about this, right? When you think about animals, animals, they don't work by instinct, but we work by, we have, we can, you know, prognosticate, so to speak. We can imagine, create, we can think ahead, solve problems. So if you're, if an animal is going against another animal, the animal that is being preyed upon is limited in what it can do because it is, it can't imagine, it can't plan. But if, if the animals had that ability, the gazelle could build like a moat. And then at the bottom of the moat, it has um, some spikes going up. And it doesn't make the lion know. And then it appears and look all nice and healthy for the lion. The lion see the gazelle and start running. And the gazelle just like, just start jogging, so to speak, very slowly. Probably to give this idea that it's probably limp. Probably the gazelle start dragging one of his foot to look injured. And just about when the lion is about to prance or jump on the gazelle, the lion drop into the mud or drop into the, 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 the decrease in the land because he dug it out and put those spikes and kill itself. That's the difference. But you see, the gazelle doesn't have that ability, but we have. So when you're dealing with life, you have to know, okay, I'm up against these people and they want to eat me. They want to destroy me. They want to destroy me financially, physically, whatever, so that they can survive, so to speak. But I have a brain. And part of this life is a game. But I really believe what it is is that the young people are being, they play so much game that the game for their soul salvation and for their physical life, they're not playing. Because they're busy playing a video game. I didn't understand that life is the video game. And the time you're spending playing that video game, you should be juicing some organic fruits and vegetables. The time you're spending that playing that video game, you should be figuring out how to financially get ahead. The time you're playing that video game, you should be in your Bible looking for gems, digging for treasures, so that you can understand how to overcome the devil and be a the overcomer. But you're not playing the game you could start off seeming like you're the fittest or you're the strongest, but you're not going to survive. So the battle is not given to the strong. As somebody said, but I thought the stronger person always win. No, many times a person who is the wiser. I always remember the story that this guy I was talking to, I used to work with, and he said to me that, Lord, you know, when I was in Vietnam War, you know, I, I learned real quickly, the big tough guys always get mowed down because they get so angry and worked up that they'll start to be that Rambo figure. figure, And they'll start going hard, and all next thing you know they do, they just get mowed down. So I learned to keep my head down, because I was like, I was going to come home, and I came home. But many of them never came home, because they were tough. Because they weren't playing survival. They weren't fighting to survive. They are fighting with anger. So the battle is not for the strong. And so that's why, in essence, when you read the Bible, it is definitely not the survival of the fittest. But it's still a struggle. Because the person might be the fittest, as I say. But they don't understand how to preserve their energy. They don't understand that probably today they're not supposed to run. <laughs> today is a day to hide. <laughs> and sometimes the lion did. Sometimes the gazelle that survives, not the gazelle on the outside. is one on the inside. They figure out, oh yeah, they're eating everybody on the outside. I'm going to run on the inside. Because if I'm in the, 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 the line not going to come in the middle, it's going to come at the end. And neither yet is bread to the wise. So bread is not to the wise. Somebody said, it's the wisest person. I've grown up and I used to be baffled by people I know and I've met over the years. Um, who are so skillful, they didn't have so much information. 
And yet there will be a person who has less information, less skill. And they're able to run circles around them, make fool of them. And I'll be like, wow, life is crazy. Because you learn it's, it's more than just simply evil wisdom, so to speak. It's more than simply, um, you know, intellectual knowledge and intellectual attainment. Because again, like I saw a situation with a person that's a, a, a physicist and he get himself into all kind of problems. And I was looking at it and say, look, he's the brightest person, but he's just made a fool of himself. And that's how he's ended in his career. Nor yet riches to men of understanding. So you could say, well, this person understands even financial concepts, and yet it's not riches to them. And then a kid come up over here and he figure out something, and he's making billions. And somebody say, how he made billions? And there's people who are professors in college that, you know, they're making good money, but they can never make the type of money that this person is making. There's people who have so much business understanding how to do business, but they never can make and do business. Because that's life. Yet favor, nor yet favor to men of skill. So somebody's saying the person who get all the favor is a person of skill. And there's this person who is from the ghetto. And he just basically, he know to work the room. And you say, man, this is crazy. But time and chance happen to them all. So you say basically time chance happen to them all. Everybody gets their opportunity. But if you don't know to take your opportunity, you blow it. So basically the Bible simply says you have to be diligent at your labor. Luke chapter 9 verse 23 through 26. So life is definitely not the survival of the fittest. Because somebody could say it's the strongest, it's the fittest, it's the fastest. It's the... Not necessarily. You look at life and so many people with so much skills. And they're going to be on the trash heap of life within 5-10 years of exhibiting these skills to the world. Because they don't know how to live. They know how to survive. And so in life, you're playing a survival game. You look at the enemies. See, you, you, sometimes people, people probably figure out, I don't understand why I don't spend all the time talking about the enemies. Little, I talk a little bit of it, but not too much. And the reason why, because I just want to understand what I'm up against. But I have a brain. I have the Bible, I have the Spirit of God, and I have um, self-control. And so then I'm going to fight those battles, but I'm fighting for survival. Because the longer you stay in a race, the more you can able to develop. And that's it. And I believe I've been in a race longer than I, I would have if I didn't have these skills. And so this is why I really believe in this. So in your life, remember, it is not so much... I'll give you an example, a principle here before I keep going to some more text. Uh, I remember years back, I used to listen to a lot of different preachers. And I remember I heard this preach, pre this, there's this group of people that preach this thing called Righteousness by Faith from the 1888 Message Committee. Committee. I remember this guy, I think his name was Whelan at the time. I think that's his name. Not, not at the time in a sense, not his name changed, but I'm just saying at the time when I remember Listen to this stuff. And I remember he, he, he presented, I was young at the time, and I remember hearing this tape. This area was cassette at the time. And he had this principle, and it, the principle is um, it's easier to be saved and harder to be lost. And it's something I'm going to preach about at my church soon. Easier to be saved and harder to be lost. And I remember hearing it and thinking, that sounds fanciful. Then I thought about it, and it didn't take me long, real quickly thinking about it. I said, that sounds like nonsense. Um, it's easier to be saved. And the, the first thought in my mind when I heard that principle, I say, yeah, it would be easy to be saved and hard to be lost if there wasn't a devil and his minions, um, human minions, and the devils that we have to deal with from day to day who try to make our lives miserable and try to trip us up and so forth and so on. The principle would work if you didn't have opponents. But because of the opponents and because of her fallen nature, we many times become her own opponents. So you got to know what you're up against. So when people tell you principles like that, if you receive them into your life and believe them and live by them, you're going to get clobbered because that makes you more relaxed. But I'm going to tell you the principle is, is blood, sweat and tears. It's not easy. It's going to, you have to look at Christ on the cross and say, that's what salvation is about. And when you start getting that, they start looking around. And that person you're dealing with, you start to have, you know, you start to have second, you know, you want a second opinion. You go to the doctor and the doctor say, I want to cut you from your head to your foot. I want to cut you open 
from the tip from the from the tip of your head to the, the little pinky and fix you up. I was like, okay, great, doctor. All right. Uh, uh, let, let me let me pray about it, and I'm gonna get back to you. I need to go get a second opinion. Your doctor say, here's some drugs. You're like, okay, doctor, thanks for the drugs. This is the prescription. I need to go fill it, right? Yeah, fill it. You're like, okay, you need to get a second opinion. I need you need to start looking for some natural remedies. You can't just go through life. Think about all these people that are dying today and have been dying every day from the opiate crisis who their doctors put them on the drugs and they didn't know that the doctor was using them to buy yachts and expensive homes. Homes. They, they didn't know that because they go into life like, oh no, the struggling life is all about something that Darwin say or some movie or video game. But they understand life is a minefield. You got to walk very careful. So in your Luke chapter 9, verse 23 through 26 says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So here's always the massive principle that Christ teaches. Very important for you to live by this. In this life, this is the only way to survive. You got to deny yourself. This is self-control. Self-denial. You want good? So simple, what you have to do is deny yourself. Somebody say, I'm struggling with this. That's what you need to do. Deny it. Get rid of it. Struggle will be over. <laughs> that's life. And so that's what it is. So when you're in this life, you like, got to deny myself. Many times people say, oh, I'm I'm in debt or I'm in, um, I'm in bad health or whatever. You start by denying. You have to deny yourself something that is for your positive good. You have to take up your cross. It's going to be rough. And you got to follow Jesus. And when you look at Jesus, you're like, where is he going? Remember, his disciples were mad. They were like, no. Peter started to rebuke him. They're like, what do you keep talking about? you? I'm going to the cross. And where did Peter end up when Peter, after Peter was converted? He ended up at the same place, at the cross. So you can see why it was like, no. Nah. Because if I'm the main follower and I'm following you, you're going you're gonna to lead me to the cross. So what kind of business business is this? And Peter, like, like, I don't want to hear that. And that's where the problem is. But that's the way to success. Because Peter wanted the accolades, you see. Peter wanted to sit next to Jesus. And Peter said, God says, well, you know, two people already have it already. But um, you're going to be blessed. <laughs> you're going to be just like me. <laughs> and that's just the problem. People want, as I said, they want the crown, but they don't want the cross. But before the crown comes the cross. And that's what it is. You have to sweat a little bit. You have to deal with some thorns. So if you get up today and you're going to work. And you're going to work. You think you're going to get ice cream. You have something coming to you. You're going to work. And as you're picking the fruits you're picking. Whether it's you're typing. You're working on computers. You're working on a machine. You're working on stuff. Stuff is going to go wrong. But if you go to work with the wrong idea that it's all going to work out well, no. Go to work and say, today, I'm back in a struggle again. It's a struggle. All right? But I'm going to fight the battles today. It's going to be rough and probably I'm going to get my nose blooded. But I'm going to survive because I'm going to figure out how to survive. I'm going to figure out, uh, probably I need, <laughs> I need to learn rope-a-dope. I need to start figuring out how to duck those those shots to my head. Because I, I'm, I'm going to survive this. And that's when you start to figure it out because that's the reality of life. But if you go in there, I think it's going to be great. You're not prepared. So you're not prepared to survive. You're not prepared to figure out how to outmaneuver people, how to, you know, turn situation around, how to make the job easier because you're just going and thinking it's going to work out good. But you got to know it's the survival is not for the fittest. Is for those who understand that they need to struggle and need to survive. I mean, because you're going to see fitter, fitter, fitter people than you get eaten all the time. And that's why many people get so depressed because they see people who are like these comedians and they think, oh, they're happy, they're laughing all the time. And then the next thing you know, pow, they kill themselves. And the people get depressed like, wait a minute, if he kill himself, what, what happened to me? Because you don't understand that's, that he's not the guy to watch. You have to watch the person who is surviving. You have to watch the person who 
they're in the midst of a storm and they can keep their head up and they can keep pushing forward. That's a person to watch. Not a person who's faking it. And that's why, as I say, with a lot of these people on YouTube, people understand that they're fake. They're not really they're not dealing with real struggles. They're not dealing with real struggles. And that's why they, they crash and burn all the time. Because they're in a fake lifestyle. They're faking it. So when you're in a fake lifestyle, you're faking it. Um, when you crash, you crash hard because you're acting as if everything is fine. But we in the struggle, people will see and say, but that don't look pretty. Yeah, because the struggle is bloody. But we're just trying to figure out how to duck and bob and weave. So <laughs> verse 24 says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall save it. So ultimately notice the aim is to save the life. But Christ is saying, I'm going to tell you how to save the life. I'm going to tell you how to survive. As I say, when we talk about natural health, what we're talking about, we're talking about how to survive longer, how to live healthier longer, how to have a better life, how to be high on life, not high on drugs. And then after a while, you're numb and then you have all kind of mental health problem and you get worse. No, we're trying to figure out how to smile longer, how to have peace in our lives. Others are trying to get there, but they get in there the wrong way and they lose life. You do it Christ's way. You find life. For what shall a man what for what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? So very important. How is you how is a person advantaged if they gain all this fame and notoriety? They seem to be the top of the food chain, but they lose themselves and be a castaway. And that's really what's happening to so many and they get cast away, new one comes along and they replace them. And then get cast away and everybody living that fake hypocrite lifestyle. But you have to live the real. You have to know. There's no video game, so to speak. There's no happy ending. This is like you got to survive. There's elements out there trying to eat you, trying to destroy you. And there's a devil that's trying to get you. And you got to survive. But you don't survive because you're the smartest or the richest and whatever. You survive because you know to be diligent at your labor, you know to pray or to watch or to look out or to be aware of your surroundings, not to get fooled by all these multi-level marketing strategies and all these scams and pyramid schemes, not get fooled by all these fake health methodologies. Health is very straightforward and, and simple. Clean diet, clean lifestyle, clean clean house it's just a straightforward exercise clean water clean your mind up clean everything <laughs> that's what it is it's very simple somebody say i want to lose weight well stop eating you can't gain weight unless you eat if you stop eating you lose weight it's very simple but somebody goes oh no there, there is more technical stop it it's not more technical nothing is more technical you want to get fit how you get fit you have to exercise it's just not a way to it. Or you gain muscle, you gotta lift up, lift heavy weight and exercise more. Just, but you can complicate things so much that it just becomes ridiculous. Mm -hmm. For whatsoever or whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my word of him, the Son of Man shall be ashamed. In First Corinthians chapter one, verse seventeen, first Corinthians one, verse seventeen, as we look at life is not the survival of the fittest, but it's a struggle. Because they say in Darwin's world, the survive, who survive is the carnal. It's the people who are more aggressive, the warmongers. Think about all the warmongers that you and I know, literally know, who've been to war and we don't know them anymore because they're dead. Or they come back, they men, their brain is like shot from all the wars that they've been through, mentally just messed up. How many people have gone into all different types of violent sports and now they're half the man that they used to be? You see, it's important to know. It's, it's, you use your head. Remember, if you talk to the kid in the school and say, who's the fittest? He say, oh, that guy over there, he runs track. You talk to that same kid 10 years later, say, who's the fittest? Oh, the guy that um, was that bookworm in school and now he's eating everybody lunch. He's a car a CEO and he, everybody's paying him and he's making millions and millions of dollars. You see, so, somebody say, so who's the fittest then? The bookworm or the, the jock? Or, you know, you see, so life switches around. It depends. But Darwin will look at it like that.
because he's looking carnal and then I guess, who is the fit who is the fittest jesus is the fittest first Corinthians 1 verse 17 and 18 it says for christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel not with words of wisdom lest the cross of christ should be made of none effect for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us which are saved it is the power of god notice there and more and more, it's just love in text like this more and more. As I see the shipwreck of many people who have dealt with it in the past, who have done ministry and so forth. And the simple gospel and the complicated gospel, whichever one you want to do, because the gospel can be very simple and very complicated at the same time, is deep, deep stuff. They were interested. They'd be like, oh, no, no, just want to preach prophecy and study prophecy. And next you know they shipwreck, all kind of mess in their life, lose money, lose health, lose everything. And I'm like, man, I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought this is the they, they would say they make the sound like the gospel is the is the minor in the Bible and prophecy is the big thing. That's all we need to get up every day and study prophecy. Uh, Paul, you know, it was a prophet himself, but you know this here he says it came to a point he would go certain places and he would use intellect, he would use this, he would use that. And he came and he said, look, I just want to know Christ and him crucified. Somebody said, why? Because it's the power of God. Somebody said, I thought prophecy was the power of God. I thought probably even the Sabbath or the, there's different doctrine. Uh, you know, this doctrine and that doctrine. You know, there's people that are doctrinal Christians. There's have a bunch of teachings and they say, which is the right teaching? And all that is good. But I'm going to tell you, and it's not the mommy bummy cross that they preach in many of these Praise and worship, crazy churches. It's the true cross. You're preaching, you can't have a praise and worship party church, celebration church, and they're preaching the cross of Christ. It's a lie. You walk out of that church, they have the devil. The cross of Christ is something that you pick up and you live out in your life. And that's why Paul, if you look at Paul's life, Paul's life doesn't match these churches. Because Paul's life was rough, not spiritually rough, was physically rough. Paul's life, he was always under the threat of death, beaten, shipwrecked, traveling, privation, sickness, all kind of stuff. That's Paul's life. So when he says, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish, but to all those that are saved is a power of God. It was not the power of God to live a, a vanilla ice cream lifestyle. It's the power of God to live a rough lifestyle. And still keep your head up and still, still and keep pushing forward. And that's where we want to be. We don't want to be in a situation where every little sniffle, every little headache, every little disappointment, every little setback, we lose it and we feel, oh, woe is me. Woe is me when it's big woes, when big hit. When a little small things come, after a while you get so tough in your head that the sniffles and stuff, they don't do nothing. It's just like, you know, let's see. If I die, I die. So what? Just keep going. You get tough. And that's what the young youngins are missing. And that's what the old, the old ones are missing because they learn it from their parents. Because life has to be perfect for them to be happy. But this is not what it is. When we look at Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, um, here it describes, in a second we're going to read it, but it describes here, what the end time is going to be like. Um, when you really think about it, I think about it, there are many ways to think about this. I uh, parse this text so many different ways. Is that these are the truly weak-minded people in our society. You know, people always say, you know, there's Christianity or this, this or that that makes people weak-minded. But the true weak-minded people in our society are people who the cross of Christ have not mean anything. They go through life and they think it's going to be great. You know, I think I mentioned this here before. I was looking a few weeks back at this young man that had killed himself called Avicii, or he died. He was a big EDM music DJ and producer. And I was reading and looking at him, and I was looking at some videos of how, you know, you always want to be happy, 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 jumping off the side of a cliff, jumping off the side of a bridge with bungee cord, jumping off the boats. Just life is just happy and great. And then boom. 20-something years old, dead. Because he was depressed, sick, mess. Because he thinking, wow, this is going to be great. I just, we just want to have fun and go on adventures and 
blah, 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 and take pictures of the greatest natural sights and, you know, blah, blah, because we live a life to the fullest, but we're depressed and we just want to take drugs and kill ourselves. See, that's not life. And that's just the reality. But here the Bible is going to describe people who that's the life they're living, but they're a mess. They're a bag of psychological mumbo jumbo and craziness. They're a bag of depression and guilt and sin sick and just. Uh, here we go. It says, um, so these are the true weak minded people. You see, they're the ones that don't see the cross of Christ as nothing. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own self. You would think if a person loved themselves, they must be happy, right? And yet, that's not the reality because that's not how you survive. You see, Christ teaches different. Christ said, You love your neighbor as yourself. Christ said, You look out for those who are less fortunate. That's how you survive. That's how you become happy. But in the survival of the fittest, Darwin teaches them go eat your neighbor, go beat upon those who are less fortunate, and then you'll be happy. But how can a person who take advantage of the weak, the children in our society? The poor be happy. You're a monster, and this is why I made him just kill himself with all that money. Because if you live your life and you've taken advantage of people who are less fortunate, you you can be happy. You might act as if you're happy, and I'm a guarantee I can bring a hundred people here and say, "Oh yeah, he's happy. He's a monster, but he's happy," because they don't understand. And then I say, "Okay," a year later, I say, "I'll bring back the whole hundred people." I say, "Hey, look, he just killed himself. I thought you guys say he was happy. He was acting as if he's happy." And he might do it for videos and pictures, but he's a miserable rest because he knows it don't happen, that he's not really living out Darwinism, but he's, he's a monster. And it's important for us to not to be monster. I've never, I think it's like you can grade this on a scale for one to ten. The more a person loves themselves and don't care for nobody else and they're selfish, is the more miserable they are. And I've never seen that principle break broken. I don't know about you in your life, you might be deceived by somebody who loves themselves and they th you think they're happy. But I've never met a happy. I, the more a person loves themselves and they're selfish, is the more miserable they are. You bring me a miserable person, I'm going to tell you what the problem is. They love themselves too much. You bring me a they're too selfish. They care less about nobody else. All it is about me, 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 me. Miserable. Notice here, lovers of their own selves. Covetous. That means the person has no self-control. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. This is the narcissist society that we have amongst us. And people believe that to go on YouTube and watch all these narcissists and think that they're happy, not understanding that this is their, their king unhappiness and queen unhappiness. They're, that's why all these rappers and stuff you see, they're taking um, syrup, uh, <laughs> what do they call it, um, a purple drank. And all these different type of opiates and um, Percocet, Perk, and all that. Depress. You sit down singing all day about madness and not be depressed. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Imagine you hate people that are good. It must be messed up. That means you have to love people that are bad. So if you love people that are bad and you have all these bad people in your life, boom, that's your problem right there. Somebody have all these bad people because they hate the good people so they can't stand the good people. So they hang out with all bad people. Well, bad people with bad people, you think going to happen? It's just going to be out of bad. <laughs> Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And you can see them in like a roller coaster ride screaming their brains off. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such the Bible. So turn away. These are people who are laden with sin, filled with iniquity and Basically, ain't nothing good coming of that. Nothing good, but it's not the life we want. So when you're up against this, you understand you're playing survival. And you're watching out because the Bible said, turn away. So somebody said, oh no, Lloyd, I can't follow the Bible. Because we have to love the sinner. Yeah, the Bible says, I love them, but from a distance. You can't, you can't go wrap yourself up with people like that. Somebody's going to stab you in your back and be a traitor, head high minded violent. You gotta be careful. Be careful. That's all I'm saying. But again, somebody might say, no, I'm going to do different. You go ahead and do different. <laughs> and let's see if you survive. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23 to 27. As I say, notice here, it's all to survive in the struggle. But when you think you're the fittest, you get eaten. 
because you think you hard. I'm not hard. So you go over there with the crazy people, the backstabbers, and then see how they, back, they stab you in the back how many times. See how much stabs you can take in your back. And then come to me and uh, have some herbs for you, and then I'll send you to the hospital. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23 to 27 says, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be particles thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receive at the prize. So run that day that ye may obtain. Every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. We who are trying to make it into the kingdom. We who is trying to live by him who have set us on this race, the Christian race. We are striving for the mastery. And so when we strive, we are trying to keep everything under control. Because when you lose control of yourself, if you lose control of your morals, if you lose control socially, if you lose control of your health, whatever you lose control of, you'll be overcome. Either you overcome something or it overcome you. But it's a fight. Remember, as I say, so many people will say, oh, the devil's got the better of me or the devil inside of me got the better of me. So you got to know that devil who's trying to keep you lazy, that devil, you know, there's not a de lazy devil, I'm just saying. <laughs> Whatever that struggle, in other words, people would say it, and they get better of it. The devil, the, the struggle inside of them that's trying to tell them to murder somebody or steal or lie or be gluttonous or be lazy, or be covetous, or be hateful, or be have no self-control in multiple ways, sexual in all different type of ways. You got to fight that devil. You got to get up today and say, I'm going to fight that devil in me. Or me the devil. <laughs> but if you don't, and you get overcome by it, then you lose in the race. But we don't want to lose. Notice it says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beat at the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I know so many people are become castaway because you know what happened? They're trying to save the world, but themselves, they can't, they're not saving. Oh, they're trying to get the gospel to people, but they haven't gotten the gospel to themselves. They're trying to get the gospel to the world, but they haven't got it to their children or their family or in their church, or to their extended family. They're saving everything, but they're not saving what's right in front of them, what's underneath their nose. So it's important. Paul says, I keep on my body, because by any means, I might preach to others, I myself become a castaway. So it's important. You're trying to make it tomorrow, but ultimately you want to make it in the kingdom. So while you're doing this, you have to play a different game. You have to play not the survival of fittest game, but you have to play the survival game. You're just trying to survive. You might not be the fittest, the strongest, the fastest. You might not be the most spiritual person. You know, there's people that they are so high and mighty. But you're trying to survive. And you see people falling by the wayside. You do things. And people are like, hey, what? hey, Lord, why do you do this or why do you do that? Because I'm surviving. I'm going to be here tomorrow. That's my intention. By God's grace. And so I do things differently. You, you getting eaten? Oh, you got eaten? Well, you know, that you understand now why I did what I did. Because did, I, I didn't plan to get eaten like you. Very important. You're just trying to survive. We close with this thought here. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 onwards says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angel nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I encourage you, um, just stay in the struggle. Use your creative abilities. Use your imagination. Don't forget to study. Don't forget to pray. Don't forget to apply the words that you learn. Live by the words. Not be a hearer of the word only, but a doer. I'm going to tell you, you don't have to be the healthiest, the strongest, the fastest, the fittest, the wisest, the most um, intellectually accomplished, but you'll survive. 
you just have to just remain faithful. God bless. Let's pray. Our Father, word in heaven, we thank thee again for your word. We thank you, dear Lord, for the encouragement that you give us from day to day and the teachings that you lay in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you may guide us along, that we might truly know how to survive. We might truly know how to be overcomers. Bless us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Thanks for being with me on Revive Reform Radio. Looking forward to talking to you tomorrow live again in the morning at 7 a.m. as we do our uh, current events topic. Until then, I pray that you may continue to walk with the King. Mm -hmm.